Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our SVCE board meeting for Wednesday, February 10th. We will call the meeting to order at 7.01 p.m. Um, I'm not sure how much I have to read this, but I think I have to read the COVID announcement. So um, this meeting will be conducted in accordance with State of California Executive Order N2920, dated March 17th, 2020, in consideration of the coronavirus COVID-19. All members of the Silicon Valley Clean Energy Board of Directors and staff will participate in this meeting by teleconference. And um, you, members of the public are welcome to comment on each item as well as the non-agendized items. If you are in the attendee box, you can raise your hand. If you're on the phone, please hit star nine. And I hope, I think that's all I need to say for now. Um, uh, so we will move on to roll call, please. <laughs> Thank you. Chair Abbey Koga? Here. Vice Chair Gibbons? Here. Willie? Here. Hilton? Here. Tyson? Here. Rennie? Here. Chua? Here. Ilahi? Here. Martinez Patron? Here. Walia? Here. Larson? Here. Ellenberg? Here. Thank you. And I will note that Director Flagger is currently absent, but she is expected to join us a little bit later. All right. Thank you very much. We will now go on to public comment on matters not on the agenda. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak on a non-agendized item? If so, um, if you're in the attendee box, please raise your blue hand. Or if you're on the phone, please hit star nine. I don't see any blue hands. Is there anyone on the phone? interested in speaking? I don't think so. I think we're good. So I will close uh, public comment then. And we will move on to the consent calendar. Um, are there any uh, board members wishing to pull and or speak to any of the consent calendar items? If so if you could raise your blue hand, please, that would be great. I don't see any hands, so I'll go open it up to the public. Are there any members of the public wishing to comment on a consent calendar item? I don't see any blue hands, and I don't think anyone is on the phone. So I will close public comment for the consent calendar, bring it back to the board. Um, if there is no other discussion, I'm ha happy to entertain a motion in a second, please. I move consent calendar items 1A through 1I. Second. Let's see, thank you. So a motion by Vice Chair Gibbons. It was a second by Member Ellenberg. Great, thank you, Director Ellenberg. Ellenberg. Thank you. Um, any other discussion? If not, could we get a roll call vote, please? Chair Abikoga. Aye. Vice Chair Gibbons? Aye. Willie? Aye. Hilton? Aye. Tyson? Yes. Rennie? Aye. Chua? Aye. Ilahi? Aye. Martinez Botran? Aye. Walia? Sorry, major tech issue, I. No Big worries, thank you. Larson? Aye. Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that motion carries with Director Flagger absent. Great, thank you. We'll go on to the regular calendar. Item two is CEO report, and we have our CEO, Balachandran. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Abe Koga. Uh, I have several updates for you today, and this is going to be a bit of a joint effort on some of the Items. First, I'd like to introduce our newest employee, uh, Jessamine Allen, who has been an intern with us since June 2020 and now has uh, agreed to join us as a, uh, sorry, she's as a programs analyst working for Amy. She's going to be leading up our building decarbonization joint action plan implementation that you approved in November of last year. She'll also be focused on the equity work, which is one of the strategic focus areas that you identified in the strategic plan. 
who says we don't need rocket scientists at SBCE? Uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Jessamine Allen to introduce herself to you. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for the uh, introduction. Um, I just want to say I'm very happy to continue working with SBCE and transition to uh, this program analyst role. Um, you know, I was in my time as intern, I was very, uh, I not only found the work uh, very rewarding, but I was very impressed um, by the organization, organization's initiatives and inspired by the work culture. So um, I'm just really looking forward to taking on these challenges in program design and, and helping SCC uh, achieve its ambitious climate goals. Thank you. So I need to explain my comment because uh, Jessamine's uh, very humble here. She does have a BA in physics and astrophysics from UC Berkeley uh, and a PhD in physics from MIT. So um, uh, we just uh, love having her on the team and looking forward to the work that she's gonna be doing for us. Thank you, Jessamine. <laughs> Thank you, getting some welcome there. Thank you. Um, moving on to our next uh, item on the update, I wanted to inform the board that I will be making a presentation to the Cities Association tomorrow. I will be accompanied by Zoe Elizabeth. We are going to talk about the $5 million program that you have approved as part of our uh, COVID relief and community resiliency program. And this has to do with community resiliency. So we've reached out to all the city managers in November. All your staff has been engaged in this program through the MOG, uh, but we also wanted to reach out to those in the Cities Association because the Cities Association also had grid reliability as one of the 2020 uh, policy areas. So we will be presenting tomorrow evening uh, and we are looking forward to continued engagement uh, with the Cities Association on this topic. And of course, the building decarbonization plan that will also be coming up. Uh, I'm now going to ask uh, Andrea to just uh, share her screen. I have a few slides that I want to share. Uh, first, uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, because we do have some new board members too, I wanted to uh, bring you up to speed on a couple of things that the board approved in uh, last year. And this is something that you do every year, which is our strategic plan. So you approved the, October, the plan in 2020. There were 19 goals and accompanying measures for each of these goals. We had about 60 measures, uh, but really getting it to the highest level, we identified five focus areas for 2021. And all this was done in collaboration with staff and input from the board. So next slide. So the five focus areas are as follows, uh, and we are making progress in each one of these areas. Uh, I just mentioned that Jessamine will be working on the equity issues. Uh, the last issue here is community outreach and leverage, uh, which is to leverage the power of all of you as elected officials and all the elected officials, the more than 70 elected officials who represent uh, SVCE. To that end, uh, Melissa has, uh, is in the process of hiring a senior government relations manager whose job would be to do a lot of the local outreach, but also connect us directly with Sacramento and advocate for our interests in Sacramento. So that position will be closing on February 19th. I expect we'll have someone in place uh, by the end of April. On digital pivot, we continue to do quite a bit of work. Uh, we have Pam and Don and their teams basically working on the e-hub and uh, over the Christmas break, we offered uh, quite a few rebates uh, for induction ranges, things like that. So that continues, uh, that work continues well. So I wanna focus on the top issue here, which is additional resources and efficiencies. And additional resources, essentially what we talked to you about last year was, we are getting to a different level of complexity in our business and also our maturity SVCE as an organization. So we want to move to enterprise-wide systems uh, and depend less on some of our consultants for core work. But overall, the work has become more complex. We do need more staff. 
And so we're working on that and we will be providing you uh, an information update in March and then um, a request for resources in April. In March, I will also be asking for some minor changes as we've had some shifting in staff over the last few months. Uh, due to timing issues and also the real difficulty in hiring for some very specialized positions where we've had to go out multiple times to get the right candidate. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, we are rather short staffed, but there are opportunities to uh, during this time. Uh, we had one of our staff members leave to another CCA on the finance side. So we're going to take an opportunity to upgrade that position to a senior financial analyst. Uh, so that's not an ad of an FTE, but we'll change the job description. Uh, you all know Hillary Staver, who left us uh, in October of last year. We're going to update that job description too, uh, to focus on having someone with uh, regulatories uh, on the regulatory side. So I'll be bringing that to you at the March meeting, and uh, we will be talking to the executive committee, of course, before that. Uh, so you can skip two slides and go to the next, because the next one is just a little more detail. I also wanted to update you on CC Power, which is California Community Power. Uh, we signed on the dotted line as per your delegation of authority to me on January 29th, along with seven other CCAs. So eight CCAs have signed up for this. Uh, jointly, we are rather large. We are, we are larger than the smallest IOU, San Diego Gas and Electric. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Pamela and her staff for doing a bang up job on the uh, PR and outreach. So I wanna share a couple of things on that. So we can go to the next slide. So Green Tech Media had an article. I just have cut and paste a little bit from here. Uh, so big time power purchaser. And I thought that uh, the quote from a uh, consulting firm, Wood McKenzie at the bottom, which turns our GPA into one of the biggest buyers of power in the country overnight. So there's a lot of potential that we have at CC Power. And of course, it's our first, we haven't had our first meeting yet. We will be having our first meeting next week. Uh, and I will be reporting back to you at the March meeting uh, with what was undertaken at that first meeting, which is mostly going to be uh, administrative work to set up the JPA. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, we also had uh, several quotes, and I just wanted to bring to your attention a quote from one of our local elected officials, uh, Senator Becker, uh, talking about how encouraging it is to see CCAs come together to develop long duration energy storage. And very proud to have Monica Padilla, our Director of Power Resources, uh, leading that RFO on behalf of CC Power. So, uh, with that, that essentially ends uh, at least my PowerPoint. I now want to hand it over to our Director of Policy, Melissa Charles, uh, to provide you an update on certain legislative and regulatory issues. Melissa. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, Andrea, can you uh, load, perfect, load the slides? Thank you. So I'm gonna talk about a bill that will be coming um related to fair access to legacy energy resources and the short version of that is basically this is related to the pcia next slide and so just to level set because i know we have new board members what is the pcia so the pcia is an exit fee and the reason it exists is because the investor on utilities like pg e basically procure electricity on behalf of their customers and when customers leave to take service under a CCA or another load serving entity, um, they are responsible for paying the cost of those resources that were purchased prior to their transition to a CCA. And those costs are recovered through the PCIA. Um, and the PCIA has been steadily increasing over the past few years. Um, and the CCAs and our trade association, Cal CCA, have been working really hard to reduce and mitigate volatility in the PCIA in the future 
an increased transparency in terms of how it's calculated because it's a bit of a black box in terms of what costs and what benefits go into it. Next slide. So a little more background in terms of this actual bill. It's related to managing the costs and the benefits of the PCIA. So the PCIA has a pretty complicated calculation in terms of how it's calculated. Um, so there are costs that go into it, but there are certain market values that or benefits that go into it as well. Um, and while PCA customers share the cost responsibility with IOE customers in terms of these legacy resources, only IOU customers have the right to access these benefits and these market value that can help reduce the PCIA. And one example is greenhouse gas free energy. In 2017, the CDC basically uh, began a process to address portfolio management and portfolio optimization issues. And what that means is basically managing the costs of the PCIA so that only the costs that go in, in, uh, into it are unavoidable costs. That's what they, that's the term of art. Um, and making sure that the portfolio is optimized so that there aren't any unnecessary costs that are um, included in the PCIA. Um, CalCCA, Southern California Edison and Commercial Energy, which is a energy management um, company, came to a consensus solution to address these inequities in terms of the costs and the benefits and who actually shares those costs and shares those benefits. Um, unfortunately, um, this uh, proposal was submitted to the PUC about a year ago, and the PUC is still considering the proposal a year later. And so, um, because time is of the essence in terms of just being able to manage the PCIA and the volatility, um, CalCCA proposed a bill that reflects the consensus, consensus solution that they came to with uh, SCE and commercial energy. Next slide. So what does this bill do? So this bill does uh, several things. The first one is to provide IOU, CCA, and direct access customers equal right to receive uh, energy lease resource products that are procured on their behalf in proportion to their load share if they pay the full cost of those products. It also requires the PUC to recognize the value of greenhouse gas free energy and any new products in the same way value is recognized for renewable energy resources and products. So these first two provisions are basically about um, making sure that CCA customers have access to the benefits as well as the costs, thereby managing the um, PCIA and mitigating any increases to the PCIA. Uh, the third provision is to require the IOUs to offer any remaining excess legacy resource products not taken by IOU, CTA, or direct access customers to the wholesale market. And the last provision is to require each IOU to transparently solicit interest in, from legacy resource contract holders in rene renegotiating, buying out, or otherwise reducing costs from these contracts. So again, it's about optimizing portfolios to make sure that they are least cost and um, provide the most benefits. Okay, next slide. So the benefits of this bill, you know, it ensures equal access to these legacy resources procured on behalf of customers for all load serving entities. It minimizes stranded costs by increasing revenues and reducing costs. It maximizes the value of the portfolio to all load serving entities, including CCIA customers required to pay above market costs via the PCIA, and it provides greater transparency um, with regards to the PCIA. And that's basically my last slide. Um, the last thing I will say before I finish my presentation is that um, Senator Portantino has agreed to introduce this bill. Um, it hasn't been introduced yet, but uh, we expect it to be introduced uh, before the 19th, which is the last day to introduce bills in, um, in the Capitol. Um, so the bill will uh, the the bill will initially have some short intent language that basically doesn't speak to the details. But uh, the plan is to amend it to include all these provisions that I basically uh, spoke about before. Um, and I do want to ask at this point, we're working closely with CalCCA in terms of 
um, really building a coalition to support this bill, reaching out to our stakeholders, our stakeholder community, reaching out to developers. And one thing I do request of you all is to, you know, spread the word about this bill. I'll definitely keep you posted as soon as it's introduced as soon as, you know, as it continues to develop, but just ask you to, again, you know, spread the word far and wide about this bill because it will be beneficial to us in the long term with regards to the PCIA. And that's it. I will stop there and just ask if you have any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from directors? Let's see, I see hands. Uh, yes, Director Elahi. Yeah, and th thank you for the presentation. I think this is a pretty complicated process. And I don't know if you've had a chance to look at what the bottom line is going to be. Uh, how much will it affect our costs? I assume if our costs go down, PG&E's costs are going to go up because they don't make as much money on it. Uh, so what is the net effect on the customer? Uh, any percentage ideas? You're talking about 0.01% or 5% or any, any range? So what the bottom line uh, change yes. uh, benefit is going to be of the exercise? I don't have that at this point, but we are exploring that in terms of what the actual bottom line numbers are. So I will be coming back with uh, hopefully some more clarity there. Any other questions, Director Olahi? No. All right. Thank you. Director Rennie, then. Thank you. Um, it, it, I don't think I saw it in this bill, but there's the also the issue of um, DA direct access in the future taking away our load, and there's no there's no protection currently that I'm aware of for protecting us if if our customers get taken away and we now have stranded assets that we've bought kind of thing. Um, is, is there any maybe that's sort of a different subject, but I wanted to ask it anyway, is there anything going on in that area? So it's not related to this bill, but yes, there are things going on there. So the PUC had submitted a staff proposal that basically provided recommendations for how direct access could be expanded over the next few years. And one of the things that was contemplated is an idea of an exit fee for CCA customers this is something we are very interested in as well. Um, where that stands right now is that um, the various parties provided comments to that staff proposal. We expect a decision from the PUC, hopefully anytime soon, because the PUC is actually supposed to go back to the legislature with their recommendations on expanding direct access. And we had anticipated a decision to come prior to that recommendation. So they are supposed to make their recommendation in March. So hopefully we'll see something in the coming weeks with regards to that as well. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Thank you, Director Willie. Yeah, so it, this isn't a question about the bill itself, but more about the, uh, the component that we're talking about, the PCIA, <clears throat> if that represents the the purchase of the equipment and facilities prior to the customer leaving PG&E and coming to Silicon Valley Clean Energy, it would kind of seem to me that at some point in time that's been amortized and disappears. Is in fact that PCIA going to disappear in one year, five years, 10 years, or are they, are they is PG&E always gonna be able to be uh, extracting money from our customers? So we do expect it to, that's a good question. We do expect it to reduce over time. In particular, in the next few years, there's a nuclear facility, Diablo Canyon, that is supposed to be decommissioned and the cost of that facility will be reduced. So we do expect some level to be declined. But when I speak about the volatility is that at this moment in time, up until, oh, actually up until now, um, uh, the costs have been collected, but they've also been um, basically recorded in a balancing account. And the amount that uh, we have paid as CCAs has been um, subject to a cap. 
And so because of that cap, there is a, an undercollected balance there that still needs to be paid. And at this point, we are in the process of working with the CPC on removing the cap, removing the other mechanisms with regards to that. So there is going to be, you are going to see increases in the PCIA because of that, but long term, there will be decreases because of certain um, resources basically being paid off or going off fund. Yes, Director. Lily, yeah, maybe just one other follow up question. Again, I'm still trying to get my arms around this PCIA. You know, having been a homeowner and paying PGE for years and years and years, I can understand, you know, this legacy component. How, you know, it just makes me want to ask the question. So let's say somebody uh, builds a brand new house. There is no legacy uh, PG and E uh, that they've been paying for, or that was done on their behalf for all these years. They come in, they they build their house, and they say, "Hey, Silicon Valley Clean Energy, I want you to be my provider." Are they also going to be saddled with? Well, you have to pay your your PCIA, even though you weren't here when those costs were incurred. So I just kind of want to get my arms around around that if it's if it's possible and maybe, maybe it's too complex. So I can talk to it briefly and I we'll dig in a little bit more to the PCIA when we do more trainings because PCIA is so complex <laughs> and messy. But the one thing I will say to your point is that all CPAs are subject to a certain vintage vintage and it's basically when uh, we started serving our customers. And so the vintage does basically affect the PCIA and what resources and costs you are in charge for. So just with your analogy, hopefully I'm not missing any nuances, with your analogy, any new house, you know, customers that any new resources um, after, built after that vintage, we would not be subject to those. I think that that's correct. So there is a vintage, there is an, uh, there is an acknowledgement and an accounting for the mechanism for when those customers were transitioned out. Um, but um, yeah, it's still, we're still dealing with under collected balances and various nuances there as well. And as I mentioned before, again, we are also trying to get um, more transparency in terms of like what exact costs are going in there to make sure those are costs that we feel are reasonable in terms of what our customers should pay. Um, let's see. Um, we have Director Elahi. And another question? Yeah, yeah. Just a follow up, I guess. Uh, you mentioned that there is a cap on the amount of PCIA that we have to pay and there's an under collected portion that is owed by uh, CCAs because of that cap. Are, are we keeping a reserve for that liability on our books? I'm just curious. I probably another question from Malaysia but maybe Girish can help out on that. Maybe I'll answer that. Uh, no, we use our reserves right now as the buffer. Uh, to pay for that. And essentially the cap for all practical purposes is removed as of this year. So the under collection, I'll just add one technical detail. The under collection from last year is being spread into three equal payments over the next three years that's been fixed already. And there will not be any more uh, of these capped under collections. There will be year to year under collections, but nothing capped. And we'll be happy to go over some of the mechanics of it. Uh, getting one's arms around the PCIA is way beyond one R. No, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and yeah. So the, these three years that you are paying off, about how much are the payments on that? You have a number? Uh, on? I'm going to say it's about a quarter cent. Every cent is about forty million dollars, so it's about ten million dollars. Yes, it's like Bitcoin, I guess. We are paying hundred. Your all our customers 
are paying approximately $160 million a year in this coming year to PG&E and the PCIA. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from directors? If not, I will open this up for public comment. If you are um, in the attendee box and would like to comment, please raise your hand. Actually, they're not blue anymore. <laughs> um, and then if you're on the phone, please hit star nine. And I will start with uh, Mr. Bruce Carney. And please unmute yourself to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess today I should make clear that I am not a cat. That seems to be the, the meme of the day. Um, several questions and a comment. So um, of the eight CCAs that came together to form CC Power, I noticed that neither Clean Power SF or San Jose Clean Energy, the single city CCAs uh, were joined. And my question is, is there something about single city CCAs that makes them not compatible with CC power. And the other thing I wanted to do is to echo uh, Director Rennie's comment about the risk that departing direct access load uh, has for SVCE. So, you know, there's a lack of symmetry between PG&E's protection from departing load and SVCE's protection from departing load due to direct access. Uh, and I think it would be uh, quite reasonable and fair to try to get that playing field leveled. Um, and and so, you know, for the benefit of the new directors, I should say that the CCA advocate community around the Bay Area and around the state has been working on C PCIA for years and years. Um, there were meetings where there were 50 advocates at a CPUC meeting, you know, basically saying we don't like the PCIA, we don't like the additional costs it imposes on customers. Um, and I thought Director Willie's question was very appropriate. Let me give you an example that may resonate with you. When the San Francisco 49ers were based in San Francisco, they decided to move to Santa Clara, which has its own municipal utility. They were not charged a PCIA because they took the load of Candlestick or Monster Stadium, whatever that stadium was called, and moved to Levi Stadium. Had they chosen to stay in Candlestick area and switch from PG&E to Clean Power SF, they would have had to pay a PCIA. So it's not about the load departing so much, it's about who the load departs to. If you depart to a CCA, your customers get taxed with a several cent per kilowatt hour PCIA. But if you move to Santa Clara or Nevada or Portland or someplace else, you don't pay this fee. So it's, it's very bureaucratic, doesn't seem particularly just. And I think it's something that the board needs to pay a great deal of attention to. And hopefully your lobbyists and your staff will be working in Sacramento to get the best possible resolution for the benefit of SVCE. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public wishing to comment on this item, the CEO's report? I don't see any hands and I don't think anyone's on the line. So I will close public comment, bring it back to the board and this is a discussion item so um, no action taken um, thank you very much i just want to also welcome is it J jessamine um yeah so it's, it's really exciting to see um interns promoting up to um being on staff and so i'm excited we're, we're excited to have you welcome and thank you girish for the report we will move on to the next item, item three, which is the appointing of um, board members to our board committees. And this is an action item and I will ask our board clerk, Andrea Pisano, to do the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So as Chair Ibekoga mentioned, this is in regards to our 2021 board committee members. So following our January board meeting, staff uh, sent out a call for interests for all of our committees. 
And this is to go over and hopefully ratify those appointments. So for our legislative and regulatory responses to industry transition for 2021, the ad hoc committee that was formed, uh, we can have up to six directors and we received six directors who were interested. And those were Director Abe Koga, Director Ilahi, Director Hilton, Director Larson, Director Martinez Beltran, and Director Rennie. For our audit committee, uh, this group, as a reminder, meets about twice a year, wants to kick off our audit and wants to receive our audit. They handle our financial audit. They review a CPUC required AMI audit in addition to an IT audit. Um, and just a heads up for anybody who is appointed to this group, we are actually finalizing our audit. So very shortly after this meeting, um, I will be reaching out to get this audit committee scheduled to meet. And we had four individuals express interest in this group. Again, we have six available slots. So the four who expressed interest are Director Martinez Botran, Director Chua, Alternate Director Brian Makachuk representing Monte Serino, and Alternate Director Hung Wei representing Cupertino. Our Finance and Administration Committee meets quarterly to discuss our financials and other administrative policies. Uh, again, this group has six slots available. We heard from five folks, Director Gibbons, Director Rennie, Alternate Director Larry Klein representing Sunnyvale, Alternate Director Brian Mechachuk representing Monte Serino, and Trevin Barber, who is a Senior Management Analyst from Gilroy, who was nominated by Director Zach Hilton. So with that, those are the interests that we received, but I would like to open it up for discussion and see if we can have this ratified or if anybody would like to add their name to one of the committees. Great, thank you very much. Um, so yes, yeah, so thank you to board members who um, volunteered for the committees. And also I just wanna um, thank the alternates. I, I don't, I th this might be the first year. I, I don't recall alternates. Maybe we've had a few, one or two, um, but it's great to see more alternates um, taking interest in joining our committees. Um, as mentioned, there st still are two spots open on the audit committee and one spot on the finance and admin committee. So um, is there anyone who'd like to volunteer for, uh, um, if, if for any of those um, openings? Yes, uh, vice chair, or if you have other comments, please. Feel free. Thank you. So fortunately, I can't volunteer for anything else. I'm at my quota. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to ask um, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, um, in the past, there was a lot of interest of having some county staff on um, some of these committees. And I'm wondering if you even thought about it. You're muted. See that. Um, I haven't thought about it. didn't know that that um, had been a thing in the past. I'm interested to know county staff from what departments was it? Uh, fleet and facilities. Where 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 did they fit? Finance, I believe. Right. So correct. So if I could answer that. Oh, uh, right. so, sorry. Uh, it's uh, Maria Oberhoff, I believe, from the finance department. Mm -hmm. uh, who was added. Um, I think this year we are quite well covered. Uh, we do have uh, substantial expertise on the finance committee, starting with uh, Liz Tu, uh, but we have Brian Mekicek uh, from Montessorino, who is a CFA, and Dalton at Director Klein. Uh, so I think we're quite covered. And I think that was more, uh, it's open to staff, but I think we're quite well staffed on committees this year, uh, Vice Mayor Gibbons. Great, Vice thank Chair. you. And, and thank you, Liz, for letting me know that that, that had been um, a practice in the past. I'll keep my eye on it for when there is a need. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that suggestion. Um, any other questions, comments? Um, and we can always um, add if you, decide later that you'd like to join another committee, we can always add, add to you later. So um, yes, uh, Director Martinez Beltran. I was going just to ask, what is the commitment for the finance committee? 
that group meets quarterly and as needed. Okay. Well, I'd be interested in, in doing that if there is an opening and if no one else is, you know, vying for it, <laughs> then okay. it's going to be interesting. Thanks. I don't see a whole lot of hands right now, so uh, we'd love to have you on that committee. Thank you for volunteering. Um, anything else? If not, I'm going to open this up to for public comment. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? If so, please raise your hand or hit star nine if you're on the phone. And I don't see any, uh, so I will bring it back to the board for um, a motion and second if there's no other discussion. Uh, yes, uh, Director Larson. Yeah, I, I move to approve the appointments as presented by staff with the addition of Director Martinez Beltran to the Finance Committee. I'll second that. <laughs> Great. Uh, so I think we have the motion by uh, Director Larson, seconded by Director Martinez Beltran. Any other discussion? Director Rennie, you have your hand up. Um, I just wanted to check. I know in the past we had some limits on how many committees could, people could be on um, based on uh, Brown Act, um, something or others. Um, and I, I'm, it, if, if Director uh, uh, Martinez Beltran is absolutely welcome on the finance committee. I'm just asking, she's now volunteered for every committee on this. It, it, the, my question is, is that okay? I wanna make sure it's okay now and we not have to change it when, later on when somebody figures out that she's on too many committees. We currently do not have a policy on a max number of committees that directors can serve on. And it wouldn't be a Brown Act issue as long as, again, it's a, uh, each committee would be looked at separately. Yeah, I just, re I recall in the past, we had some discussions of the same people on, I guess, several mm -hmm. committees became a majority some weird way or something. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about it. That was probably about three years ago. We talked about that, I think. So, okay, well, just checking. It may have been um, like a majority of the committees we're on several committees. And it was something was like that. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? If not, could we get a roll call vote, please? Yes, thank you. Chair Abbe Koga? Aye. Vice Chair Gibbons? Aye. Willie? Aye. Hilton? Aye. Flieger? Yes. Tyson? Yes. Rennie? Aye. Chua? Aye. Ilahi? Aye. Martinez Beltran? Aye. Walia? Aye. Larson? Aye. Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Great. Thank you. And I, um, staff will be uh, noticing us soon about uh, scheduling our meetings. Chris, great, thank you. Uh, we'll go on uh, to item four, uh, and um, this is adoption of a uh, potential resolution approving a change in time of uh, our regularly scheduled board meetings um, to 5.30 until the governor's COVID order is terminated. Um, and we again have our board clerk, Andrea Pisano, for doing the presentation. Thank you, Chair. So as the title states, the purpose of this item is to discuss a time change to our regularly scheduled board meetings to 5.30 p.m. And this would be under the governor's executive order. And this would be by adoption of resolution 2021-03. Some background on how this discussion came about. There was interest expressed at our November 2020 board meeting um, to explore possibly meeting earlier. We have been virtual now for almost a year. And uh, now that we have all of our board members in place, we felt it was a great time to bring this up. So this was first brought to our executive committee last week at their February 4th committee meeting for a recommendation and discussion. And at this executive committee, we reviewed three possible scenarios related to a potential change, which included starting before 4 p.m., 
starting after 4 p.m. and also taking no action and leaving the time as is at 7 p.m. And each of these different scenarios were weighted and pros and cons of each. I have the supplemental slides in your agenda packets if you'd like to look at that. And at this executive committee, the committee members requested that um, if this were to be adopted, uh, that we would review following the termination of the governor's executive order. We would review this potential time change once that order has been terminated. So the recommendation from the executive committee was to adopt this resolution by approving a change in time of our regularly scheduled board meetings to 5.30 p.m until the governor's executive order is terminated, at which time uh, that would be under review by the Board of Directors. And with that, I would like to open it up for discussion. Great, thank you. Um, any questions by board members? Yes, uh, Director Ellenberg. Thank you. Um, I, I, it was I who asked um, the executive committee to consider a different time and what I had been uh, hoping for or, or really leaning toward was something that was that could be held during the workday, um, both on behalf of, of staff and in any of us who also just don't favor evening, uh, evening meetings. The 5.30 um, compromise, I think as presented is potentially uh, problematic, particularly for um, board members or staff members with young families. I mean, that, that's a particularly chaotic time of day. I do appreciate that it's only that we're thinking about it only until um, the end of the pandemic, because certainly for most of us to drive to Cupertino and be there at 530, I think is not at all a treat. Um, and what I'm what I gathered from the the feedback that was just presented is that an afternoon meeting is not favored, like a three three o'clock start, not favored by um, the executive committee. But I, I would almost be more inclined, while we're remote, to leave it at seven than to do it at at five thirty if there's not consensus around an afternoon business work day time. But happy to hear from everybody. Thank you, Director. And um, if I can just jump in, we did look at other times. So you, uh, it was 5.30, 6, 6.30. Um, <laughs> the reason, <laughs> and we're open to any of them, I would say at this time, we were um, we appreciated wanting to do it earlier, um, especially with Zooming, um, right. it's easier to do it at this time. And that's why we thought we would just do it for this period during COVID and then reevaluate once we open up again. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, but th there wasn't an appetite for something that's in the in the middle of the workday once think, a month. Um, yes, yeah, so some of the directors work, um, work right. job, and so it'd be challenging <laughs> for them. And then um, also we were trying to think of the public too. If um, you know, there are members of the public who work a nine to five ish uh -huh. job, then it would be challenging. But um, yeah, we, so that's why we thought the earliest we could probably do is five thirty. Um, but again, you bring up a good point. And so we're open to anything. Um, yeah, 536, 630. I mean, I personally would like it to be a little earlier. I think um, seven does get, when we have longer meetings, does get kind of a little late. And we have yeah. council meetings Tuesday nights that go till midnight or 1 a.m. <laughs> so it, it's hard to stay up late another night the next night. But um, again, pretty open to uh, what others' uh, preferences are. So cool. as am I, thank you. Thank you. Any thoughts or, yes, um, Director Martinez Beltran. Well, I appreciate both of you and your perspectives. Um, and I know that you are sensitive to, you know, parents and everything. I hate to be a party pooper, but it is really, it, it's, it's hard for me to do it sooner, you know, with one partner working and then dinner and kids. And so, but just, um, you know, I will certainly go with what the majority of the group feels, but for me, I, my vote would be seven. Well, thank you, appreciate it. Appreciate your comments. Yes, uh, Director Willie. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I definitely uh, want to, uh, you know, try to be as uh, uh, agreeable as as possible, but to try and you know um, put out the many considerations that we have um, for uh, for those that that do work like myself, I find that midday meetings are very challenging to shut off the work to then switch to being uh, fully engaged in, in Silicon Valley clean energy to then re-engage at work. I, I find that uh, a challenge. And <clears throat> so, so whatever time it is toward the end of the day, you know, uh, facilitates being able to say, okay, the the regular career job is now over, and now I need to be uh, fully engaged. And so then we're talking about, okay, five thirty. I thought was you know a pretty reasonable uh, 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 compromise, bringing it down from seven, which is is late. Again, I, I worry about you know divulging too much in the sense that, you know, I don't want um, to be perceived to be, oh man, he's got so many um, uh, issues. I have three kids, uh, five, eight, and 13. But I find that, you know, um, the family really does try to accommodate, you know, the, the uh, public service that I do. And so with that, even though there's the small kids and, and dinner and things like that, I'll do whatever I can to, to make sure that if the, if the majority says, gee whiz, 5.30 or, or whatever, then you know, I'm going to work my schedule for that. But I'm just trying to, to highlight the fact that there are these other uh, very important um, aspects to to us being able to attend the different meetings. And so with that, I'll just kind of leave it to, you know, I'll try and do whatever I can to, to um, join with the majority. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Director Flager. Thank you, Chair. Um, and as a member of the executive committee, I supported the 530 proposed time. And as the chair explained, um, we had a long discussion and discussed different times and the pros and cons of the different times. Um, and definitely anything before 5 p.m. I think was rejected by most, if not all of the executive committee members because of the reasons why we've heard already a concern that we do have people that have full-time jobs. Um, and I am I actually have a full-time job, but fortunate, fortunately for me, my job is somewhat flexible. So it's more of a consideration for those who do not have that flexibility or are essential workers where they're actually not working from home to be able to quickly jump on a Zoom call and participate in a meeting. So I do feel strongly um, for those reasons, especially because we're a public service entity to ensure that whatever time our meeting starts, it really accommodates and allows for full participation from directors and also members of the public. Um, I came in ready to support 530 based on our discussion at the executive level, but hearing from directors Martinez and Martinez Beltran and Director Wiley, I can also go back to 7 p.m. if that really accommodates their schedules. And I agree with Supervisor Ellen Berg and the chair where 7 p.m. and we have our late council meetings on Tuesday as well. Um, it is a later start um, than I would prefer. And sometimes our meetings do go long, but it's the work that we've signed up to do. Um, and so I am. I'm fine supporting the 7 p.m. based on what I've heard from our colleagues um, this evening, uh, because I think what we should really do is, you know, look at the, the individuals who have the, le the least flexibility and try to accommodate their schedules. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, Director Hilton. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm a family man right now too, and, and um, I, I would favor staying at 7 p.m. rather than switching it to 5:30. Um, for the same reasons that everybody else thought. So I just wanted to 
put that out there um, that, you know, I would agree on seven. I would like, I, I am in a flexible job where I could do it during the daytime, but I understand the majority of the people are not able to step away. And I, that makes it very clear to me that it's hard to unplug from work and then plug into SBC and then go back to work. I completely understand that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Tyson? Yes, let me just echo that I'm in support of all of these options. Uh, and I would say the message to all of us is we should all be in great support of Chair Abby Koga in having efficient, quick meetings. And if you ever feel like yourself wanting to talk to, you know, just get a sense for the room and, and cut it down and then we'll be done by the time that, that we need. Thank you. <laughs> I would appreciate everyone's participation in, in that efficient meetings. It sounds like a great plan. Um, Director Ellenberg. Thanks. I think George nailed it. If, if we are efficient and sensible with our, our time and focus on the issues that really need the conversation, um, then we can, can move smartly through and truly um, Moms get short shifted in the in the business world and an elected world all over the place and and truly even if it was just uh, one one parent one mom here I would say that we don't make it harder um, for her and I will have a little bit of caffeinated tea and and keep it going at at seven because I I, I do also really. Um, uh, respect everybody's opinions. This is one of the most agreeable boards I've ever uh, seen and, and want to continue to work well together. Great, thank you. And Director Chua. Thank you, Chair. I also came in uh, thinking supporting uh, 530, but hearing the feedback from everybody, I would, I would support the 7 p.m. as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Martinez, Beltran. I just want to say thank you. We, um, Supervisor Ellenberg is right. We have a great board. So this is really awesome to see. Thank you. Great, and Director Larson. Yeah, I'll just say that I, I support all of the options, but I especially am interested in accommodating families, uh, making sure that it works for them. And having been through Considering time changes on other boards, it's always hard to do in part because the people who volunteer for this board are people who could make the meeting time that was initially advertised. And so to find another time that works for everyone can be extremely challenging. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, I just wanna thank um, all of you. I appreciate the, the collaboration here. And um, it sounds like we're probably, we will just stay with our 7 p.m start time, I do need to open this up for public comment, but I do appreciate everyone's consideration. And, um, and but the other thing too, I think from this exercise, we realized was that we can reconsider this later on um, if, you know, if our circumstances changes. So please keep that in mind. And with that, I'm gonna open this up to public comment. Um, Bruce Carney, please unmute yourself to speak. Thank you. Um, even though I've never been elected to office, I have also been at city council meetings that ran past one o'clock and I, I, I pity all of you who have to do that. Um, good decisions seldom get made past 11 in the evening and I'm glad that SVCEA board meetings typically are well run and over by 9.30 or 10 o'clock at the very latest. As you decide when you want to meet please focus on the needs of the 13 elected officials who serve on the board and the half dozen or so staff members who attend these meetings more so than members of the public like myself or James Tulea, um, the only two members of the public who routinely attend board meetings. Uh, we're pretty flexible. We can show up whenever. Um, I don't care whether it's 5.30, 6.30, 7.30 or any other time. Um, Pick a time that allows you to be refreshed, to have had a chance to read the 300 plus page packets and make good decisions on behalf of your constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other members of the public wishing to comment on this item? 
I don't see any more hands and no one on the line. So we'll close public comment and bring it back to the board. And actually, because we are not changing the time, I don't think we need to take an action. So we will just um, leave it as is and move on to item five, which is adopting a resolution to implement the SVCE generation rate changes effective March, 2021. And our presenter is uh, Mr. Don Bray, our Director of Account Services and Community Relations. Welcome, Mr. Bray. All right. Uh, thank you, Chair Abe Koga, and good evening, directors. Um, uh, many of you who are serving on the board in December know that we did a major item on, uh, on a rate reset. Um, PG&E made major changes in the rates as of January 1st. And uh, we mirrored that with uh, a big series of changes we made ourselves. Um, and uh, yes, we're talking about this topic again. Uh, this was not a misprint uh, on your agenda. Um, PG&E is um, about to issue another big round of, of rate changes for March 1st. And uh, we wanna be responsive to that. Uh, so next slide, please, Andrea. So where we are today is uh, shown schematically here uh, on the left. Our rates to our customer are comprised of, of our generation rate. That's the, the blue rectangle. And then the, the PCIA uh, that the customer pays. And when you put those two things together, um, that's, the, that's the full generation rate. And we want to be less than PG&E. We want to be competitive with PG&E. And the, uh, the board voted in December uh, to uh, to move to a 1% discount. Um, so this is what our, our basic rate structure looks like today. If we move over to the right, um, as of March, uh, we are going to see PG&E raise that uh, PCIA very significantly uh, by another 8% or so. And then they're also going to raise their, their generation rate slightly. Um, if we don't do anything, we're going to be uh, effectively more expensive than PG&E. You know, so our generation rate stays the same, the PCIA goes up and puts us above what, uh, what PG&E's generation rate would be. So uh, what we recommend is that we reduce our generation rate uh, to bring our effective rate to the customer that includes the PCIA down below PG&E's new generation rate by, uh, by 1%. Uh, next slide, please. So with any rate change, there of course are uh, are trade-offs, and you know the basic trade-off that we're dealing with here is um, reducing rates to to stay competitive, so to maintain uh, our competitive position. Uh, but the trade-off is that uh, that reduces our revenue and reduces the the contributions to reserves uh, that we'll make uh, during the year. So we're going to talk about some of the numbers here uh, in the uh, the upcoming slides. Uh, next slide, please. So changes like the ones that we're seeing this year, um, and I'm, I'm lumping the, the January changes in uh, with the March changes, uh, have negative um, a negative impact on us sort of in two ways. First, the, the PCIA rate going up means we have to reduce our generation rates. And if PG&E's generation rates come down, that also requires that we reduce rates to stay competitive. Our original assumptions in the in the 2021 operating budget were that we were going to see an increase in the PCIA from 3.2 to 4.8 cents right at the, the start of the fiscal year in October. And then that PCIA would, would back off a little bit to, to 3.7 cents in January. But you know, for the, the year as a whole, uh, that would represent a 25% a uh, weighted average increase in the PCIA. We also expected that the PG&E generation rates would remain flat. And to accommodate these two changes, uh, our, our plan was to, to go to a four, from a four to a 1% discount uh, as of last October. But then um, moving over to the right side of the page now, um, things changed. Uh, there was a delay in that increase in the PCIA. And when it happened, it, it didn't go all the way up to 4.8 cents. It, it went to, to 4.25. Um, but then there was also a very significant reduction in PG&E's generation rate of, of 4%. Uh, 
in January. The, the blended impact of that January um, set of changes with, with the March changes is that um, if we balance it out for the entire year, we're looking at about a 31% weighted average increase in the PCIA for this fiscal year versus, versus the 25% that we thought we'd have. And for generation rates, we're looking at a, a decrease of about 2% for the entire year versus flat as we had assumed in the plan. So the, uh, uh, the dreaded double squeeze, the, uh, the PCIA going up and gen rates coming down, both um, influencing uh, our rates uh, downward. Next slide, please. So if we do, do move to this, uh, um, this new set of rates and maintain a 1% discount in March, um, that'll lower our generation rates by about 2.3% on average, and it will reduce our contribution to reserves for the remainder of the, the fiscal year by about $4 million. Um, it will keep our rates competitive uh, at that 1% uh, discount to PG&E. Um, we've always had a discount since the, the start of, of SVCE uh, to PG&E, and we, we think that's important to maintain. We're concerned that opt-outs uh, could increase if we, if we go above PG&E. Uh, particularly from some of our most rate sensitive customers. Um, the, by reducing our rates, we limit the overall impact of this, uh, this rate change to about 1.8%. Our rates still will be going up slightly um, uh, in, in total because of the PCIA increase. Um, and as I mentioned, we will um, see about a, a $4 million reduction in our contribution to reserves, but we still anticipate that our reserve balance at the end of the, the fiscal year will be uh, on the order of $150 million. Um, next slide, please. To put that, uh, that $150 million in perspective, um, this is uh, a chart that shows our, our reserve targets as an organization. So the, the red bar represents our minimum range uh, reserve target and the yellow are maximum and the blue are our target uh, and then the green bars represent where we are uh, with our reserves so at the beginning of this fiscal year uh, we were a little above 150 million and we're projecting at the end of this fiscal year we'll be right at about 150 million um, there's going to be a lot more resolution put into the those projections for year end um, coming in March, uh, in March, there's uh, what's known as the uh, mid-year uh, budget update, which is a, a major process each year, uh, whereby uh, we, we reforecast exactly what the, the year-end results will look like based uh, on where we are six months in. Next slide, please. So netting this all out, um, it's our recommendation that we, uh, we update rates effective March uh, to maintain a 1% uh, discount to PG&E and, uh, and that, that competitive positioning uh, that we've had. So I'll open it up at this point for, for questions. Great, thank you, Don. Are there any questions from directors? Yes, Director Lahi. Yeah, and thank you for the presentation. And uh, uh, you budgeted about uh, I think it was four or five million, four million coming out of the reserves. And I also understood there's going to be some more money coming out to meet the caps, the PCIA that was capped, and we're going to be paying that over the next three years. Uh, is that considered also, or is that going to cause uh, some additional reduction in the reserves? Well, yeah, what, what you're referring to will influence the, um, the amount of the PCA, what that PCIA is um, over the next couple of years. And, you know, we're, we're working very hard right now to uh, forecast what that PCIA will be. And as you heard earlier tonight, it, it's, it's complex. It's a bit of a black box, uh, but we are working on, and it's not just us, we're working with our, our fellow CCAs to, um, to really get a good fix on what that, that PCIA will be. We, we know for sure that it will go down in the 2025 timeframe or so. Um, 
because of, as I believe Mel mentioned, the uh, uh, Diablo Canyon nuclear plants coming offline, which is one of the big contributors to the PCIA number. But what happens between now and then is subject, you know, to some degree to movements in the market where, you know, the cost of power is at a wholesale level. Um, if, if the price of power goes up, the PCIA comes down and, and vice versa. So we're trying to forecast that into it. Um, net, net, we can't be 100% sure of exactly where it's it's going next year. It's it's not going to fall by a lot. That you know that much is clear, unless there's a, a, a dramatic increase in the, the price of power. Yeah, no. I'm just going to add to what Don said. Uh, the capped amount that's being collected now is in this year's PCIA, so that is included in the four million dollar reduction. It's included in there. Okay, but I, I thought the number you mentioned, and, and I wasn't understood the future part. I thought this was already understood as what the cap is that we are supposed to be paying, and we are going to be paying over the next two years. And I thought the number Girish mentioned was about forty million dollars, which would be about ten million every year. So, uh, am I getting that wrong, or are we? Is there more? To, obviously, there's more to it than that. Uh, so, Javed, you're mixing up two different things. Uh, yeah. What I said was the cap amount is about $10 million a year. Our customers as a whole are paying a little more than $160 million a year, of which the cap part of the PCIA is about 10 million. So for the purposes of what we've said today, the $4 million reduction in our revenues includes the $10 million amount that our customers are paying. So when you look at that slide that uh, Don talked about, it's the PCIA is paid by our customers. We are reducing our rates so that our customers see a discount. So that $10 million that our customers are paying, that's part of the $160 million. That's something they are paying. We're going to reduce our revenue so that the total rate that they see is going to be less than pg &E's. Got it. Thank, thank you for clarifying it. Okay. Uh, Director Walia. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Abikova. So uh, this is a follow-up and we have talked so much about PCIA being a new director. I don't follow all the details. But the bottom line question that I'm hearing or, or rather what I'm hearing is that moving forward, we are probably anticipating more PCIA increases from pg &E. So the question is when do we revisit or when do we understand what are the financial impacts on SVCE revenues? So the, the next time this will come up will be next month. So when we do the March um, mid-year budget update, there'll be another discussion of this, you know, what we're, um, well, the assumptions we have through the end of the year um, and to the extent that there are discussions of, of the following year that would be, that would be uh, talked about. So is this typical? Has this been happening over the last few years or is it new? Uh... <laughs> no, it, 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 it's happened since the, since the start of SVCE, the, the PCIA has, has literally gone up uh, every year. Um, there is more in the way of, of understanding now, and I think the ability to forecast it, it's starting to come into view. We do know it will be going down in, in a few years. We're very confident of that. Um, but the precise movement of it has been very difficult to forecast. Okay, that's the volatility that Militia had talked about earlier. Yeah. And so yeah. this is a challenge. Essentially, the, the, what I need to keep in mind is this is a challenge, ongoing challenge financially. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the problem is that we don't know how they calculate this PCIA. It's like a, we keep calling it the black box. And so that's what makes it so challenging for us to predict what it's gonna be. Um, but. I think the good news is to 2024, we do expect it to go down. So my thought is we need to ride it, ride the wave for a couple more years at least. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair. 
There we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, I think it's uh, next month's going to be very helpful for um, um, everyone because there was a very important phrasing um, in the presentation, which is that the four million dollars has to do with uh, contribution to reserve, so that the budget has an, a, an assumption of all of these variables. And that says that in this particular year, we'll put in 25 million, 2 million or nothing. So what this particular situation is telling us, we know that PG&E um, has absolutely no schedule of when they're going to raise and lower rates. Every time they decide to raise and lower rates, the PCIA gets involved. So it's, it's very dynamic and staff has, I'm going to say, a very um, big ear to the ground trying to figure out what PG&E is going to be doing and all the CCA are working to understand that. So um, this is talking about uh, um, a reduction in the uh, projected contribution to reserves and we'll learn more about it next month. Correct. Yes, the the fact that we have to reduce rates by a little bit by that couple of percentage points does reduce the amount of revenue we bring in. Hence, it reduces the the contribution to reserves by that amount. There are lots of other things going on. There's supply costs we're paying. There's other rate influences like the one we had in January. But if we isolate this one, you know, this this exact action that we're taking here, it it will reduce the uh, contribution by about that amount. Four million. Thank you, uh, Director Willie. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, pretty nice, pretty organized uh, presentation. So the the question I've got is that we're reducing the contribution to the reserves by four million. The what is the the uh, unreduced contribution? Had there not been this increase by PG&E, and is the four million still above, you know, the the uh, no contribution, or are we going into the reserves slightly to keep that one percent below PG&E? And then I'll have a follow-up question after that. Uh, you know, we I kind of get an understanding of that 4 million, are we still putting money into the reserves or you know, are we actually dipping into the reserves uh, to keep that 1%? So um, again, we'll, we'll do a, a more full accounting of this uh, in the mid-year budget, but to, to address your question directly, the combination of the rate reduction that we made in January and the rate re reduction that we're proposing here in March um, are are going to take us into to negative territory slightly for this year, and both of the that was why we talked about on that one slide how the PCIA has gone up more than we anticipated in the budget for this year, and PG&E's gen rates came down when we were anticipating them to be flat. Both of those have influenced our uh, our rate downward and resulted in in us being you know slightly slightly negative but the exact accounting of that um, and and then looking at our supply picture and everything else um, will be done in the, the mid-year budget so I think you'll get a fuller view of of the complete equation uh, at that time so then the the kind of the uh, follow-up question which um, is really more of just trying to to understand you know we we like this term especially you know in uh, uh, clean energy, sustainability. And well, as it pertains to our reserves and revenue versus uh, our expense for the power, you, you know, I'm just very uh, focused on, you know, making sure that what we set in place is sustainable from a financial standpoint. If we really are dipping into the re reserves to maintain that 1% uh, discount, um, you know, uh, how, how much uh, are we able to, to do that and be reasonably sustainable? And so you're probably right that we're gonna have to wait for a more fully account, 
uh, fully accounted uh, presentation, but that's kind of where I'm going is that I'd be looking to hear that in March, you know, uh, that it's sustainable. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And that, you know, there are a number of levers we can pull, right? Um, we can, we could raise our rates and, and that, you know, would make us more money. We may have opt outs, but we we probably make more, you know, more money net. Um, there are things we could do with our NIM, our net energy metering policy that might result in some increased revenue. There are um, decisions we can make on the supply side relative to what's in our supply portfolio. Uh, maybe we, you know, change the nature of the, the renewable or carbon free um, mix uh, and, and, and uh, that the, and it might result in reducing costs. So there are other things we can do, and and yeah, that that's a a perfect tee up actually for the the March uh, budget update. Thank you. We'll go to uh, Director Martinez Beltran. Sorry, Mike mute button isn't helping me. Um, I just I just quickly wanted to ask, <clears throat> we had talked about prior, we went to 1% discount, but I, we talked all the way up to 4%. And I think a lot of people were entertaining too at the time. I'm wondering, you know, what, what this kind of looks like for us. And then you talk about that we'll, we'll slightly go into negative territory, but do we expect that to increase and look more positive as we move out of COVID? Again, I think, you know, good, good question for, for March. Um, we, <laughs> we, yeah, we will, we should see some uptick in, in volume, right? Okay. Um, but I, I don't know that that's going to fundamentally change our, our financial position relative to the, the challenge of the PCIA. Um, just to, to manage expectations there, but yes, that that will have a that will have a slightly positive uh, effect or should. But I mean, this is the whole reason that we did do the you know we were conservative with our discount is we knew that this was coming or some change was coming. So Correct. we saw this yeah. coming. We were very conservative in the discount, and um, and so I guess you know going with the one percent, we kind of gave ourselves a little bit of cushion for this to occur. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice <laughs> Chair. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you can pull it up easily, Andrea, but the slide shows the reserves. I just wanted to uh, provide some elder stateswoman uh, perspective here. Uh, over the years, uh, there was, uh, particularly at the beginning, there was a very strong commitment to building up reserves. And uh, if you, the red line there is the minimum, and that's really where we started. We were gonna be thrilled if we got to that minimum. And then we said, well, you know, we've got the capability to really protecting um, our agency. We're still new and young. So we set up the blue bar, the target, and then the yellow gar guide was really an upside limit so that maybe we should be doing more in programmings or more in discounts and more other things. So the red, blue, and yellow lines are kind of guidelines, um, big picture decision-making on rates. And um, I just offer that if you look at uh, the blue line, we are still uh, above the target. And we're not actually, when we say in the red, we're not actually losing money we're simply not putting money into our reserves and we're utilizing um, the reserves if and when necessary, but that's what it's there for. So there's a, there's a substantive amount of reserve funding. So we're not, we're not at any risk at this point in time. And this is what staff is uh, very conscious of at the budget period and the mid-year budget is to to help us understand what decisions we need to make um, that protect the resiliency, I think and Director Willie said, um, of the organization. Thank you, Vice Chair. That's a great explanation. 
We'll go to uh, Director Tyson. Well, Liz just stole my thumb thunder uh, because I was going to say very much the same thing that we should just be looking at that chart that we've taken some time to build up these reserves. And now we're going to be in some choppy water and uh, it'll go up and down. We're, we're looking at it from the overall strategy. And, and I think uh, Don, in terms of days of sales, it, it's a substantial number that we've got. So we're, we're just gonna weather this storm. And, uh, and I'm not so worried. So I'm, I just wanna go ahead and say I'm, I'm in favor of this move. Thank you. And Director Rennie. At, at the danger of repeating, my, my comments were really the same thing. You know, the purpose of having the large reserves is because we knew there is going to be this volatility. And, and one thing to think about over, you know, the last couple of years, you know, there was an under collection of the PCA. So we filled up our reserves. Well, they're coming back down a little bit because we already got the money ahead of time. And if you look how, you know, the difference is it's only a drop of $6 million. If we lost six, or we, we shouldn't call it loose, but if we took 6 million out of our reserves over the next three years, that's still pretty insignificant compared to the 150 million. So, you know, when I look at it, you know, I say, okay, is there a systemic problem that we should worry about that's gonna lead to bankruptcy at some point or something like that? And, and the answer is no, this is, this is part of the business that we expect to happen where there's going to be some, you know, fill up years and there may be some points where we, we drop it down a little bit. And that's the why we picked the, the reserve size numbers that, that we have so we can smooth things out and we can smooth it out for our customers. And, and the point that, that Don made is also really important not to lose customers for those that are, that are new. When we formed this CCA, we were, we were able to take all the customers from PG&E and people had to opt out. Once those customers go back to PG&E, we can't steal them. We have to earn them back, which is a lot harder. So it's, it's really important. Uh, you know, he has a really important point that we want to hang on to the customers um, if, if we can. Of course, at some point, if you know, we get into real systemic trouble, we may have to go rates above, but I don't think we're anywhere near that. I think we can last out till the PCA, PCIA starts dropping. And even if you just look at the economy part of this, remember what Dire um, um, Director Bray said is, as the cost of power goes up, the squeeze gets less on us, right? We're in a pandemic, so power prices dropped. It's not surprising that this was a squeeze year for us kind of thing. So anyway, I'm sort of echoing the same, same things that Director Givens and Tyson um, mentioned. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the board? If not, I will open this up for public comment. Any members of the public wishing to speak, please raise your hand. Uh, and I see Mr. Carney, please unmute yourself to speak. Thank you. Um, I try not to speak three times in any given board meeting, but this is a topic that is very important to me. So the first thing I want to say is that I've attended PCE board meetings as well, and they've chosen a different path. They've chosen to be 5% uh, below PG&E on gen rates, which means they're about 2.5% below on the total rate that their customer sees. But they are burning through their reserves at a rapid rate. And I don't think they had the kind of support from their finance department that SVCE directors are getting from your finance department. I'm, I'm very pleased that SVCE um, is paying more attention to the reserves and to the sustainability of the discounts that are being offered. So I think 1% is a perfectly reasonable discount and I support the staff proposal for rates. Um, SVCE is fortunate that among those, S, among those CCAs that have very, very high rates of GHG free electricity, um, your costs of power are very low. Um, some of the other CCAs charge 5% more than SVCE does. Part of that is because 
you bought a lot of your contracts at a very advantageous time, um, an opportunity that may not come again. Uh, but the other thing is that you're a very well-run organization. And my perception is that a customer who is currently getting any kind of a discount compared to PG&E has no incentive whatsoever to leave SVCE to go to PG&E to pay an extra percent. It just doesn't make any sense. People don't leave a vendor that's providing good service to go pay more to somebody else particularly if that somebody else is a convicted felon like PG&E is. So I want to encourage you to um, support the staff proposal. I want to encourage you in the future to remain 100% greenhouse gas free, to strive to be 100% greenhouse gas free 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And um, to recognize that you are a member of a board that is, in my estimation, the premier uh, the premier CCA in California. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any members of the public wishing to comment? I don't see any other hands, so I will close public comment and bring it back to the board. Um, there's, let's see, this is a action item. Crystal, um, yes, it will be the adoption of resolution number 2021-04. Great, thank you. Tyson will so move. Thank you. Second so, from Rennie. Great. Um, so motion by Director Tyson, second by Director Rennie. Any other discussion? If not, could we get a roll call vote, please? Yes, thank you. Chair Abekuga? Aye. Vice Chair Gibbons? Aye. Willie? Aye. Hilton? Aye. Flagger? Yes. Tyson? Yes. Rennie? Aye. Chua? Aye. Ilahi? Uh, Director Ilahi? No, no, we will come back to Director Ilahi. Uh, Martinez Patran? Yes. Walia? Aye. Larson? Aye. Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. And Director Lahi, are you present? He may have stepped out for a moment. I believe he did. He's oh. muted. Oh. Director Lahi, are you there? I think he may have stepped out. So, should, should we go ahead and? Mark him absent for this? Be absent just for this one, better. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we'll, to be continued in March. And you know, I feel like we do this topic quite often <laughs> in our, in our just deliberations. So um, more to come, but thank you. We'll go on to item six, approval of the resolution authorizing the CEO to execute a U.S. Department of Energy Western Area Power Administration Sierra Nevada Region contract. And we have our Director of Power Resources, Monica Padilla, here to present. Thank you. Good evening, directors. Yeah, it's a mouthful. It's a big, res it's a big uh, title, but <laughs> Basically, we're asking uh, the board again to approve the resolution, which would give the authority to the CEO to execute this contract uh, with the Department um, of, of Energy um, Marketing Power Administrator called Western Area Power Administration for a contract that we like to refer to in, a, as a short, in short as the Western Based Resource Contract. So I'll refer to it as Western Based Resource from now on, hopefully. Uh, next slide. So just to put things, give a little bit of context, uh, the Department of Energy has several marketing agencies throughout the United States. And the one that we're talking about here is called Western Area Power Administration or WAPA, uh, noted in the area in blue. And these power marketing administrations, they're charged with providing power or marketing the power output out of several US um, facilities 
including a big project located in California called the Central Valley Project, which is a big hydroelectric resource. And so through, um, through WAPA's efforts of marketing this um, resource, SVCE has an opportunity to be a customer, what we call a Western-based resource customer. The next slide. A little more focus as in terms of exactly where uh, our connection would be to WAPA. Uh, each of the different part, uh, marketing administrations have regions within their area. And for us, it's one called the Sierra Nevada region, and that's why it's part of the title. So the Sierra Nevada region is located in Folsom, and the staff there specifically operates and dispatches uh, the Central Valley Project uh, power resource. Next slide. Uh, a little more perspective here. This is the Central Valley Project. Um, it's a series of dams and generators, transmission lines um, that kind of pretty much go through all of the Central Valley, starting as far north as, as uh, Shasta or Trinity area, and as far down south as Bakersfield. The Central Valley Project was built back in the 30s, and it was primarily built by the Bureau of Reclamation for the purpose of flood control. And so back in the olden days before the project was built, uh, that area of Sacramento, known as the Sacramento River Basin area or the Delta area, would flood every year or more often than once a year. And so the project really was built for flood control. Um, because it's such a beautiful area of the state and there's so much natural habitat and uh, rivers that run through there, uh, the Central Valley Project also serves uh, a, a huge amount of recreational uh, purposes throughout the state, as well as irrigation for many of the farms and the irrigation districts throughout the state. So it has a lot of purposes um, and the generation of power is one of the lower priorities for this project. But because they've got all these dams and generators throughout the facility, it's able to produce a relatively inexpensive source of renewable, uh, sorry, carbon-free energy. Next slide. So uh, Western or WAPA marketed essentially what was a 2% of all of the CVP-based resource available uh, for start in 2025. They have a, a whole bunch of customers that have had a contract in place with Western since 2005, which is set to expire at the end of 2024. So Western allowed all those custom customers to essentially uh, retain 98% of their current allocation and then took 2% away and said, we're gonna look for new customers for this 2%. And so to be a Western customer, you kind of have to meet a certain amount of criteria, including you have to be a non-for-profit like SVCE uh, because the, the, the output or the benefits of this project cannot go to uh, profit serving entities or marketers. And you also have to, your, your philosophy in terms of uh, protection of the environment and carbon free resources or energy efficiency have to align with um, the state's goals and the project, the, the federal government's project's goals uh, for this resource. So they want to make sure that the entities that are taking this resource have share in their desire to improve the environment. And so we were awarded a very small allocation. So you can see there, it's a, of that 2%, we were awarded 0.32467%. So an itty bitty amount, uh, which would amount to a very small percent of our uh, needs anyway, our carbon free needs. We would get about 10,850 megawatt hours a year uh, based on the average hydro year. And that amounts to about 0.2% of our load. So a very small amount, but nonetheless a valuable resource. Next slide. So a little bit of the, um, the nature or the elements of the contract. Um, again, the owner of this resource is uh, the Bureau of Reclamation um, and they own and maintain and operate it. The marketing arm again is the Department of Energy under WAPA. Uh, what we would receive is carbon-free large hydroelectricity. So this helps meet our clean goals. It doesn't help meet our renewable portfolio standards, but it does help meet our overall clean goals, um, which again, we're 100% clean. The term for this contract is 30 years. And again, it starts January 1st, 2025. Um, on average, again, we would get about 10,850 megawatt hours and the capacity associated with that same allocation that we get. The contract is unique in that it's, it was considered a take or pay contract. 
So the resource itself and the availability of the resource will be dependent on hydro conditions. In dry years, we'll get a lower amount. In wet years, we'll get more amount. But our obligation to pay for this resource is, is essentially fixed. It's whatever the project takes to operate and whatever um, other kind of environmental restoration fund payments there are. So on a per unit basis, it can vary year to year. Next slide. So a couple of interesting elements though, um, is because there's variability in the cost, there's certainly variability in what the perceived value or the value of this resource is going forward. And so the contract allows for two uh, kind of unique options uh, under the contract. The first one is a one-time option to reduce our allocation or to terminate the contract entirely six months before we start delivery for June 30th, 2024. So if, if for whatever reason we decide we don't want to enter into a 30-year contract with, um, with WAPA, we can terminate at that time. The contract also allows for off-ramps, clear off-ramps. So every five years, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission will set the rates associated with this contract, the fixed cost, the fixed rate and how it allocates to us. And so they'll give us an opportunity every five years to again, reduce our allocation or terminate if we don't think this resource is valuable to us anymore. But even though I'm not providing the price here, just based on the, the revenue um, or the, the expected revenue requirement or our costs, this, this resource is very cost effective on an average basis in terms of meeting our carbon free needs. And I think it'll continue to be valuable, especially as the whole state goes carbon free by 2045. Um, next slide. So this is the request is for, um, again, the board to authorize or approve the resolution, which would authorize the CEO to execute the Western contract, Western based resource <laughs> following um, attributes. We get an annual allocation of 0.32467%. It's a large hydric, hydroelectric resource coming from the Central Valley project. It is a take or pay contract uh, for which we will be obligated for our annual costs based on that allocation. And it's for a 30 year term starting January 1st, 2025. So with that, um, I guess if there's any questions. Great, thank you very much. Any questions from directors? Yes, uh, Director Larson. Yeah, thank you. Just a quick question. Uh, you mentioned there were several points at which we could reduce allocations basically every five years. If, if we would do that, is that a permanent reduction or could we come back five years later and say, you know what, we, we actually, we want that back again. It would be a permanent reduction because they would remarket that allocation to somebody okay. else. That makes sense, thank you. We could though do a short-term layoff. We could connect with another customer, another base resource customer and say, hey, for the next five years, we don't want our allocation or we don't want it all. Are you willing to take a share of it? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Director Willie. Yeah, um, sounds great. I mean, you know, hydroelectric sounds adding that to our portfolio. So one question <clears throat> pertained to the uh, statement about wet years and dry years and the hydroelectric output being more or less can you give us an idea of what history has shown? You know, we've been through some, some drought years in California. Can you give us some idea how did that impact that? And then if those dry years happen, does that mean we just shift our purchase then back to PG&E for the, for the reduction in the hydroelectric that we had hoped for? Sure. Um, well, the interesting thing about this project is that even though it's been operating since the 1937, that time frame, and you would think that you would have all these years of historical data that you could rely on to assess on what the variability is of this resource. In fact, there's been studies, uh, uh, there's a document called the Green Book that talks about historical uh, generation and how it relates to drought. But the reality is that going forward, um, the operation of this resource will be more and more constrained. And so even though you can look at history to see how, what the correlation is between hydro conditions and operations, the 
the forecast is that it's going to change over time. But that said, we do have historical data and you know, we can look at dry years. Um, I think the last big dry, drought was like 2015, 2016. And we could look at wet years like 2007. And we know that for our allocation for our very small percentage that we would get, we can expect to get as little as 6,000 a year, uh, 6,000 megawatt hours a year, um, and as much as 19,000 or 20,000 megawatt hours a year. So that's the variation that we're thinking about. In terms of what happens when uh, there's a dry year or a drought and we don't get as much as we expected, then we're essentially buying those carbon-free resources, whether it's large hydroelectric or RPS resource on the market. We will not be buying it from pg e unless we specifically want to buy it from pg e which we could do. But essentially we would go out like we do today because that resource doesn't exist in our portfolio and we procure from the market for uh, these resources. Great, any other questions? If not, I will open this up for public comment. Any members of the public wishing to speak, please raise your hand or hit star nine if you're on the phone. And I don't see any public comments, so I will close the comment and bring it back to the board for uh, action. And this item would be uh, acted on by the adoption of resolution 2021-05. Thank you. So moved. Second. Let's see, so uh, Director Ellenberg and Director Beltran, motion in a second. Any other discussion? If not, could we get a roll call vote, please? Thank you. Chair Abenkoga? Aye. Vice Chair Gibbons? Aye. Thank you. Willie? Aye. Hilton? Aye. Flagger? Yes. Tyson? Yes. Rennie? Aye. Chua? Aye. Ilahi? Aye. Martinez Patran? Check your settings. Yes. Thank you. Walia? Aye. Larson? Aye. Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Great. Thank you. We will move on to item seven, the time of use rate update by Director of Account Services again, uh, Don, Mr. Don Bray. For, we will present. It's a, good evening again, uh, directors. Um, if we can have the, why don't we go straight to the second slide, uh, Andrea. Yep, so as, uh, as was mentioned, this is a, a discussion item, um, important update on a, a major change that's going to be happening in the way that we bill many of our, our residential customers. Uh, so later this year, we're gonna be moving more than 150,000 of our residential customers who are currently on a tiered rate structure to a new time of use rate structure. So in this presentation, we'll talk about the, the scope and the timing uh, and the, the whys behind this, this transition. Um, we'll do a quick primer on, on tiered rates versus time of use rates. Um, we'll talk about what the impact of this is to customers uh, the options that our customers have and some protections that they have uh, in this process. Uh, we'll talk about the communications plan for this and then just summarize uh, what, what the benefits of this, this overall move are. So next slide, please. So the first thing to know about this is that uh, this is being driven statewide uh, by the CPUC. So uh, PG&E and the other uh, two uh, IOUs in the state um, are all under a requirement to transition tiered rate customers to uh, time of use, um, time of use based rate plans. And uh, since all of our customers are PG&E customers too, uh, that puts us uh, squarely in this mix. Um, this, however, is actually optional for us. Um, we don't have to transition our customers, at least for the generation portion of the bill. Um, but we did vote. Uh, in August of 2019 
to participate in this time of use transition and most all uh, CCAs have. Um, so um, this, uh, this has been coming for a while. The original move was planned for October of 2020 and yet it was delayed by PG&E partway through last year, or actually partway through uh, 2019 to uh, actually occur in June of this year. So we are going to be part of what's known as wave three. Um, we will be moving along with San Jose Clean Energy uh, in June of 2021. Uh, wave one is going to be East Bay. Uh, that's happening in April and in May, Sonoma Clean Power. And then uh, we're next in wave three. And there are several other waves after this that actually go all the way into to early next year. Next slide, please. So this is being driven by the uh, the notorious duck curve. Um, as, as we know, we see this major uptick, uptick in the requirement for uh, fossil fuel generation uh, late afternoon, early evening, uh, when the sun sets and solar power starts to recede. And current rate structures don't really reflect this, this reality. Um, what we see in terms of wholesale prices is about a, a doubling of that wholesale price during that peak period, uh, late afternoon, early evening, relative to, to other times of the day. Uh, and yet our current rate structures, particularly tiered rate structures, just don't reflect that reality at all. So next slide. So a, a, a tiered rate uh, is what most of our customers are on, uh, over, over 87%. Uh, and what it means is that the more you use, uh, the more you pay. So for the first um, 300 or so kilowatt hours you use in a month, you'll pay a, a certain rate. And then for the next um, 3x above that, you're going to pay a, another rate. And then you're going to pay a higher rate still for any usage uh, above, I believe it's 1,200. Uh, kilowatt hours in a month. So this is uh, this is the standard way that that most of our customers are billed. Um, but this is very ineffective in terms of encouraging customers to use less energy during the peak time of the day. This is effective for encouraging people to use less energy in general, but just not uh, effective in in changing the the timing of that usage. So that the tiered model is really about sort of energy efficiency in general, but not about the timing of, of, of energy use. So that's, uh, that's the motivation here behind the change. Next slide, please. So a time of use rate, uh, as the name implies, varies the rate depending on, on what the time of day is. And the, the default time of use rate, and there are actually a handful of them, but the one that, that customers will be defaulted into under this, this time of use transition, is called TOUC. And it looks like what you see here below. Um, there is a peak period between four and 9 p.m. in the evening where customers are going to pay more and all the other hours of the day, they, they pay less. During the summer months, that delta, uh, the difference between the off peak and peak rate is about six cents. Um, and then during the winter, it's only a couple of cents. Uh, so it's actually relatively flat in the, uh, the winter time. Um, this is again, time of use C, that's the, that's the schedule name. There are other time of use rates that have um, more of a differential and you could move to one of those if it's in if it's in your best interest and you can go on the pg e website and you can type in these different uh, rate schedules and see which one uh, you're, you're best off on um, but the standard transition is taking everyone to this this time of use c rate think of it almost as a an entry level time of use rate maybe the most forgiving one <laughs> just because of the the relatively modest uh, differential between peak and, and off peak times um, it's important also to note that energy is um, dirtiest right between 4 and 9 p.m. because of all that um, fossil fuel fired power that has to be um, put onto the grid as the sun sets. Uh, energy is cleaner during the, the other times of the day. So we're also 
attempting to incentivize customers to use power, not just when it's more expensive, but when it's dirtier. Or not to use it then. Next slide, please. So we did a pilot on all of this uh, back in the 2018, 2019 timeframe and our Milpitas customers who came to SVC right at the same time were part of this pilot. They had, they were going to be in it either way and then we, uh, we transitioned them. So we became part of this pilot along with um, other CCA customers uh, up in Marin and, and Sonoma. So we learned a lot about how this worked um, it actually went very smoothly as the, as the bottom line. Uh, next slide, please. The way that uh, the communication process went, and it's gonna be done similarly this time, is that customers receive um, notices by mail, hard copy uh, notices by mail at a 90, 60, and 30 day interval prior to the, uh, to the transition. So the transitions in June, we're going to be seeing mailing starting uh, as soon as next month. The 60 day mess, uh, the 60 day mailing actually gives customers a, an analysis of whether they will be a, a net benefiter or a, a net uh, a net loser under the new time of use rate and gives them options for other time of use rates that they could choose. So an uh, interesting um, bit of analysis provided directly to customers as part of this, um, this uh, initial uh, communication or set of communications. Next slide, please. So what we saw in the pilot, and this was very true statewide, you know, where these pilots were run, was that about 70% of the customers that were opted over to this new time of use rate elected to remain on that rate. 15% um, wanted or opted to switch back to the tiered rate that they were originally on and another 15% decided to go to a different time of use rate. So there's a lot of optionality in this. Um, customers will be transitioned, but you have the option to go back. You just have to make a, a proactive decision to do that. It's somewhat similar to the you know, enrollment process that we went through when, uh, when we launched SVCE with the, with the requirement that customers opt out if they don't wanna be part of this. So you could opt back to your tiered rate or you can opt to a different time of use rate if you wish. In terms of the overall impact, this has been, um, been studied since the, uh, the pilot and it did result in some overall load reduction. In other words, by bringing this to customers attention and, and educating them on the fact that they're gonna be paying more during these peak hours, they use less during the peak hours. Some of that load shifts to other hours of the day and some just uh, was, was um, reflected in overall load reduction. Where, where this was most apparent was in hot climates where air conditioning is a big component of the load. And so if you can adjust the timing of your air conditioning, you can really make a big uh, dent in, in your energy usage during that, that peak time, typically a, a very warm time during the day and when people come home from work and such. But if you can pre-cool your home or those types of approaches, um, you'll, uh, you'll really benefit under this new rate structure. Next slide, please. Another feature of this transition is that customers that are automatically um, transitioned to this new rate are offered bill protection, which means if they do happen to, to do less well under the new time of use rate than they would have done under their tiered rate, they're paid the difference uh, for that first year. So it's think of it as a trial period. And, and we, I'll share some results on how that worked for our, for our pilot customers. Next slide. So the results look like this. Um, of uh, 5,000 or so of, the, of those 7,500 customers in Milpitas that, um, that transitioned and stayed on the new time of use rate, about 40% or 2,000 saw no, no real gain or loss out of moving to the time of use rate. They were 
what's known as neutral, <laughs> neutral customers. Um, a little over half saw savings with this, uh, savings that averaged about uh, $24 over a year. So that, that gives you some sense for the, the scale of the change here. And then there were customers in this case, um, between five and 10% that were net losers under the move to, to time of use and they were bill protected for an average of about uh, $20 over the course of a year. So a lot of numbers, but the the big takeaway from this is with any rate change, there are winners and losers. Um, some people that will do better, um, some people that won't do as well. There of course is the option to change your behavior and, and do better, which of course is encouraged and may explain why there were more, more winners than losers here. Next slide, please. So of that couple hundred thousand customers that are on E1, uh, our tiered rate today, um, some won't be eligible for this transition. So medical baseline customers uh, will not be transitioned, nor will customers that have moved in recently, say within the last 12 months. So that, that does bring that number down a little bit. And then again, of that, of that number of customers that are that are transitioned over about 70% will ultimately um, stick with the new time of use rate. 15% will go back to tiered and 15% will, will go to another time of use rate. Next slide, please. Um, there's a lot of marketing going on at a statewide level, really sort of awareness marketing. You may have seen these ads for keeping California golden, but it, it very much, um, seeks to reinforce this notion that when you use energy is important. So kind of putting up the philosophical umbrella, if you will, over this whole time of use transition. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will be doing this transition at the same time as San Jose Clean Energy. So we're working very closely with them now on um, a joint press release that's gonna be coming out very soon. And it's gonna be branded uh, with, uh, with us San Jose Clean Energy and PG&E. Um, the 90, 60, and 30 day notices that go out are going to be jointly branded between uh, San, uh, Silicon Valley Clean Energy and, and uh, PG&E. Uh, and then we're going to be doing, um, um, of course, um, social media and, uh, and other promotions to support uh, this, this move. And Jim, next slide, please. So in summary, uh, what's good about this is it uh, offers customer lower rates when the renewables mix on the grid is higher. Um, and it, conversely, higher rates when the demand is high and when, and when uh, energy is dirtier, when the, uh, the gas use on the grid is peaking. Um, the, the average customer saves with this um, and it's low risk from the standpoint that there is this bill protection notion. Um, there are, uh, there's optionality in all this. So customers have choices and they're presented with those choices in the, in the, the 60 day notice uh, very specifically relative to, to their historic usage. Um, and maybe the, the biggest point for all of this is that um, moving to time of use rates removes a penalty for strategic electrification. It means there no longer is a penalty for using more electricity. It's about when you use the electricity. So if we're encouraging customers to, to buy EVs or to switch to a heat pump electric water heater, for instance, um, that's going to increase their electricity usage. Under a tiered rate, that pushes them to the right and means every additional kilowatt hour they use is going to cost them that much more. With it, with a time of use rate structure, there isn't that same issue. Um, it's important when you use it, but it's not about how much you use in total. Charge your car at night and you'll save, <laughs> as a for instance. So that's a uh, uh, that's a summary of uh, what the time of use transition is all about. Happy to take questions. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Bray. Any questions? Yes, Director Tyson. Yes, thank you, Don. That was a really very nice presentation, very thorough. And I understood completely what you said about the uh, rates affecting consumption, consumer decisions that made perfect sense. 
And so I want to talk about a different incentive. If somebody is considering installing solar in their home, does this change the relative uh, attractiveness of this since they're only going to generate electricity during the low cost, low value times of day? Uh, great questions. Uh, over the last several years, um, it, it's been required of solar customers that they go on to a time of use rate. So um, there was what was called NEM 1.0, the first wave of, of solar customers. And this was probably through the, I'm thinking it was 2016 or so. Those customers could be on a tiered rate or they could be on a time of use rate. But anybody um, adopting solar or implementing solar at their home after that has to be on a time of use rate. I mentioned that there were a handful of different rates. Uh, so that's that's a decision that the solar customer gets to make, but they they have to be on a time of use rate. So, and all those rates do show some degree of you know power being more expensive in the evening hours than uh, than during the day. So, to some extent, what you're talking about has already uh, been been addressed. I'm going to say that I'm on a time of use right now, and I'm getting premium pricing from say noon or eleven till four. Uh, when I'm generating the most electricity, um, we'd have to we'd have to talk about that one offline. But yeah, the 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 time of use rates should should show a, a differential, um, you know, a higher differential in the in the evening hours. <laughs> you may still be getting a good rate during the day, but if if your solar only generated in the evening, you'd really be on the money. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm speaking about myself, and this isn't all about me, I know, mm -hmm. but I'm really thinking about incentives for solar for average people and what, how, how can we make sure that we keep that, that interest level high? Mm -hmm. what, what this will do, and, and, and there's going to be changes coming in the NEM tariffs more generally um, in the next few years, it's, we're going to see more and more of an incentive for storage. And you know, so generate that power during the middle of the day, and then use it during the evening hours. Um, there's, there's a, and and in the work that we're doing, the direct outreach we're doing uh, to residential customers, we're really promoting more and more solar plus storage, or simply adding storage to your existing solar system if you already have one. Thank you, uh, Director Chua. Her hand went down. So, okay. Oh, work day, work day. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, Chair, and thank you for a very nice presentation. It's very clear and very simple to understand, especially for somebody like myself who is new to the board. My my question is uh, on the pilot uh, study, and the result is there's a certain percentage that you said went to another type of TOU. What, what is that? So there are a handful of other time of use rates that vary. The, the, the standard one that I mentioned, and maybe we could even put up that slide, um, right. Andrea, it was like the third or fourth slide. Um, the the default option that people are being transitioned to makes the peak time of use period four to nine p.m. in the evening. Mm -hmm. There are there are other time of use rate structures where that peak is actually between five and eight p.m. in the evening. So it's I'm sorry, it was the one after this, I believe. There, it's that one. Yeah. yeah, that's one. Yeah. So there are other time of use rates where the the shape of the time of use peak is a little bit different. It might be a little narrower or even a little wider. Um, and the rates are varied. So where the off-peak rate will be lower, but the peak rate will be higher. And so there's a really a, a family, if you will, of time of use rates. And any customer can go to, to PG&E's website, and that's what we recommend. And uh -huh. you can you can look and see if you've been a customer for at least a year and, and have you know some history uh, with uh, with PG&E, and they can tell you 
which of these time of use rates uh, will be best for you, at least based on your historic usage. But as I mentioned, the, the default rate time of use C is, is a good entry level time of use rate. It's, it's fairly forgiving. Um, there isn't a huge difference between peak and off peak. But if, if you're a more sophisticated energy user and, and if you can really time how you use energy, you may be better off on one of these other time of use rates. Great, thank you, Don. Thank you, Chair. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions? If not, I will open this up for public comment. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? If so, please raise your hand. And I don't see any, and I don't think anyone's on the line. So I will close public comment. And this is a information item. So uh, we will, if there's no other discussion, we will close this item. Thank you very much. And we will now go to board member announcements and direction on future agenda items. Do any board members have anything to share? And I don't see any hands. So with that, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much. It's uh, 9 12, adjournment at 9 12. Um, we'll see you soon. <laughs>